shortly before reaching Aka in 1868, and for several years thereafter, Baha'u'llah, in powerful and majestic language, addressed a series of letters to the world's reigning monarchs, setting forth his claims and the highlights of his peace program. He addressed similar letters collectively to these same rulers and heads of state, as well as to leaders of religion, various segments of society, and humanity in general. In these tablets, Baha'u'llah declared that human society was about to be revolutionized by the birth of a world civilization. Soon will the present day order be rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. This mighty transformation, he said, would come about through historical forces, which the kings could resist or ignore only at their own peril. He advised them to have mercy on themselves and on those beneath them by joining forces to bring about the unity of humankind. Baha'u'llah outlined three ways the kings could respond to this appeal. One, they could investigate his claim, acknowledge him as the source and author of the new world order, and establish in his lifetime the most great peace, the spiritual rebirth of humankind through its fusion into a planetary brotherhood. Two, they could reject his claim, but might still establish what he called the lesser peace, a strictly political unity involving the creation of a world government and a system of collective security to abolish war. Although this would not in itself heal the deeper spiritual maladies afflicting humanity, it would make such healing possible by paving the way for the long-range establishment of the Most Great Peace. Three, they could reject both proposals, in which case God, working through the ordinary masses of humanity, would in his own time still bring about both the lesser and the Most Great Peace. The short-term result, however, would be convulsions and chaos on a scale hitherto unimaginable. Within this broad context, Baha'u'llah offered specific advice to individual rulers and in so doing made a number of detailed prophecies. The most important of these letters were compiled in a book entitled Surah i Haikal, Discourse of the Temple, published in 1869 in Bombay, India, and later reprinted several times. Many of the prophecies in that book were published and widely circulated well in advance of the events to which they refer. This divine summons, which embraced within its scope so large a number of the crowned heads of both Europe and Asia, their reaction to these ominous and prophetic epistles and the consequences which ensued and can still be witnessed today are the salient features of the story to which we now turn our attention. During the relatively brief but turbulent period in Adrianople, and in the early years of his imprisonment in the citadel at Akka, Baha'u'llah summoned the monarchs of East and West to recognize the Day of God and to acknowledge him as the one promised in the scriptures of the very religions those monarchs themselves professed. Emperor Napoleon III of France, the most powerful ruler of his day on the European continent. Pope Pius IX, the supreme head of the Roman Catholic Church, wielding the scepter of both spiritual and temporal authority. 
the omnipotent czar of the vast Russian Empire, Alexander II. Queen Victoria of England, whose sovereignty extended over the greatest empire the world had yet witnessed. Kaiser Wilhelm I of Prussia, newly acclaimed monarch of a unified Germany. Francis Joseph, the autocratic king emperor of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and heir to the far-famed Holy Roman Empire. Sultan Abdulaziz, absolute ruler of the Ottoman Empire and the embodiment of the combined power of the Sultanate and the Caliphate. And the notorious Naziruddin Shah, the despotic ruler of Persia and the mightiest potentate of Shia Islam. In a word, the preeminent embodiments of imperial power and sovereignty of their day became, one by one, the object of Baha'u'llah's special attention and were made to sustain in varying degrees the weight of his appeals and warnings and the inevitable consequences of their reaction to his summons. In the surah i muluk the Tablet of the Kings, written in Adrianople in 1867, Baha'u'llah addressed the rulers of the world, collectively and apostrophically. He called upon them to be just and to reduce the size of their armies to allow for smaller budgets and greater prosperity, and pointed out that if they resolved their problems diplomatically, they would only need to maintain forces sufficient to defend their territories. Compose your differences and reduce your armaments that the burden of your expenditures may be lightened. Heal the dissensions that divide you, and you will no longer be in need of armaments except for the protection of your cities and territories. We have learned that you are increasing your outlay every year and are laying the burden thereof on your subjects. This verily is more than they can bear and is a grievous injustice. Know ye that the poor are the trust of God in your midst. Watch that ye betray not his trust, that ye deal not unjustly with them, and that ye walk not in the ways of the treacherous. If ye pay no heed unto the counsels which we have revealed in this tablet, divine chastisement shall assail you from every direction, and the sentence of his justice shall be pronounced against you. On that day, you shall have no power to resist him, and shall recognize your own impotence. Examine our cause, inquire into the things that have befallen us, and decide justly between us and our enemies, and be ye of them that act equitably towards their neighbor. If ye stay not the hand of the oppressor, if ye fail to safeguard the rights of the town trap, what right have ye then to vaunt yourselves among men? To Christian rulers he said that he was the spiritual return of Christ whom they were awaiting. O kings of Christendom, heard ye not the sayings of Jesus, the Spirit of God? I go away and come again unto you. Wherefore then did ye fail when he did come again unto you in the clouds of heaven? to draw nigh unto him, that ye might behold his face, and to be of them that attained his presence. In another passage he saith, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And yet, behold how, when he did bring the truth, ye refused to turn your faces towards him, and persisted in disporting yourselves with your pastimes and fancies. Ye welcomed him not, Neither did ye seek his presence, that ye might hear the verses of God from his own mouth, and partake of the manifold wisdom of the Almighty, the All-Glorious, the All-Wise. Ye have, by reason of your failure, hindered the breath of God from being wafted over you, and have withheld from your souls the sweetness of its fragrance. Ye continue roving with delight in the valley of your corrupt desires. He castigated the French ambassador in Istanbul for colluding with the Iranian envoy against him. 
He condemned the Ottoman authorities for substituting their own principles for those of God, for hypocrisy, and for unjustly banishing him from Baghdad and Istanbul and then Edirne. He denied opposing the Sultan and urged him to gather around himself upright ministers with whom he should consult. He sternly criticized the great gap between the wealthy and the poor in the empire, and more especially in Istanbul, and urged the Sultan to intervene to distribute wealth more equitably. Bahá'u'lláh sent two letters to Napoleon III of France. The first letter, written near the end of his exile in Adrianople, probably around May 1868, was dispatched through a French minister friendly to Bahá'u'lláh. It is unique among the tablets to the monarchs in that it is written to test the sincerity of the emperor's motives and deliberately assumes a meek and non-provocative tone. It narrates in heartbreaking language 25 years of privations and sufferings afflicting the followers of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, including exile, slavery, and imprisonment, and even though they were innocent of any crime. The tone of Baha'u'llah's appeal to Napoleon amidst such oppression is not one of supplication. Rather, Baha'u'llah elevates his address to the level of principle. By celebrating Napoleon's reported statements regarding his sense of obligation towards the oppressed, the poor, and the helpless, Baha'u'llah then confirms the validity of such principles and unambiguously lays out the duty incumbent upon the emperor. It beseemeth the king of the age to inquire into the conditions of such as have been wronged, and it behooveth him to extend his care to the weak. On the basis of this spiritual principle, expressed by the emperor himself, Baha'u'llah makes clear the necessity for Napoleon to extend upon the Baha'i community the shelter of royal protection. Here, again, a positive response to this request would imply an understanding and acceptance of the principle of the organic oneness of humankind, so fundamental to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. Most rulers of the period, however, would not feel any moral responsibility to assist anyone outside their national boundaries or cultural kinship. The tablet was clearly aimed to engender a response consistent with Napoleon's vaunted pronouncements to emancipate the oppressed, implying that Napoleon might use his power to effect the emancipation of the Baha'i community from the oppression of the Turkish and Persian governments. The awe-inspiring theological meaning invested into this mild tablet, however, is only understood when placed in the context of both Baha'u'llah's second tablet to Napoleon and the events that followed in Napoleon III's reign. The sole confirmation that the tablet reached its recipient comes from a letter of the French minister quoted in the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf. Baha'u'llah narrates, Addressing himself unto the kings and rulers of the earth, he imparted unto them that which is the cause of the well-being, the unity, the harmony, and the reconstruction of the world, and of the tranquility of the nations. Among them was Napoleon III, who is reported to have made a certain statement, as a result of which we sent him our tablet while in Adrianople. To this, however, he did not reply. After our arrival in the most great prison of Akka, there reached us a letter from his minister. In it he was cordial and wrote the following. I have, as requested by you, delivered your letter and until now have received no answer. We have, however, issued the necessary recommendations to our minister in Constantinople and our consuls in those regions. It is reported that Napoleon III cast the first letter aside angrily and ridiculed its contents. Napoleon was the first Western ruler to whom Baha'u'llah sent one of his history-making letters. He was also the first ruler to be caught up in the rushing winds about which the letters spoke. 
in the very year when the Bab first announced the advent of Him Whom God Shall Make Manifest, Louis Napoleon was inspired to write a treatise on the elimination of poverty. He appeared at that time to be in tune with the spirit of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. The abolition of extremes of poverty and wealth was one of the basic principles which Baha'u'llah urged the kings of the earth to bring about. But Napoleon's actions belied his rhetoric. Within a period of just 16 years, the emperor led his nation into three wars that ruined France economically. In 1849, he helped overthrow the Roman Republic and restore the Pope. He joined England and Turkey in 1854 in the Crimean War against Russia. He secretly promised in 1859 to help Count Cavour drive the Austrians from Italy in return for the promise of Nice and Savoy. But Napoleon withdrew from the war when he saw that Italy, instead of forming a weak confederation, would be united. He supported a scheme making Maximilian, the Archduke of Austria, Emperor of Mexico in 1864. Napoleon hoped to increase French prestige, but United States pressure in 1867 forced him to withdraw his troops from Mexico and leave Maximilian to his fate. Louis Napoleon was given the opportunity, through the councils of Baha'u'llah, to become an instrument to advance the welfare of mankind. But the king was unable to put aside his own personal desires and narrow national interests. Baha'u'llah's first tablet to Napoleon III would have been delivered 16 years into the Second French Empire and one year after the disastrous end of Napoleon's Mexican adventure which left the noble Maximilian dead and his wife, Charlotte, bereft of her wits for the rest of her long life. The political context was changing swiftly. In the wake of Napoleon's alignment with the Papal States against the Italian troops of Garibaldi. At the time, Napoleon III was the most powerful ruler on the European continent, but the seeds of his destruction were being sown as prophesied so dramatically by Baha'u'llah's second tablet to the emperor, dispatched from the prison at Akka. Though the first tablet, sent to Napoleon from Adrianople, was written in a mild and solicitous manner to test Napoleon's vaunted concern for the oppressed, the second tablet sent from the most great prison in Akka was written in a commanding and authoritative tone, as though the Lord of Hosts himself was speaking. O King of Paris, tell the priests to ring the bells no longer. By God, the True One, the most mighty bell hath appeared in the form of him who is the most great name, and the fingers of the will of thy Lord toll it out in the heaven of immortality in his name, the All-Glorious. Arise thou to serve God and help his cause. He verily will assist thee with the hosts of the seen and the unseen, and will set thee king over all that whereon the sun riseth. Thy Lord in truth is the All-Powerful, the Almighty. O King, we heard the words thou didst utter in answer to the Tsar of Russia concerning the war in the Crimea. Thy Lord verily knoweth, is informed of all. Thou didst say, I lay asleep upon my couch when the cry of the oppressed who were drowned in the Black Sea wakened me. This is what we heard thee say, and verily thy Lord is witness unto what I say. We testify that that which wakened thee was not their cry, but the promptings of thine own passions. For we tested thee and found thee wanting. Comprehend the meaning of my words and be thou of the discerning. Hadst thou been sincere in thy words, thou wouldst have not cast behind thy back the book of God, when it was sent unto thee by him who is the Almighty, the All-Wise. We have proved thee through it, and found thee other than that which thou didst profess. For what thou hast done, thy kingdom shall be thrown into confusion, and thine empire shall pass from thine hands as a punishment for that which thou hast wrought. 
hath thy pomp made thee proud? By my life it shall not endure. Nay, it shall soon pass away, unless thou holdest fast to this firm cord. We see abasement hastening after thee, whilst thou art of the heedless. It behoveth thee, when thou hearest his voice, calling from the seat of glory, to cast away all that thou possessest, and cry out, Here am I, O Lord of all that is in heaven, and all that is on earth. In these most dramatic and portentous words, Baha'u'llah, the prisoner of Akka, addressed Napoleon III, the most powerful and celebrated monarch of his day. The ancient citadel, situated within the walled city of Akka, the saint jean d'Arc of the Crusaders, that same fortress which withstood the siege of Napoleon Bonaparte, the uncle of Napoleon III, could not hold within its massive walls the edict of the Lord of Hosts. The tablet to Napoleon III was secreted from the prison and delivered to César Ketifaku, son of the French consul in Akka, who translated it into French and sent it on to Paris. Ketifaku later became a Baha'i upon witnessing the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy when Napoleon III was defeated at Sedan in September 1870. The fate of a king, a nation, an empire, and a dynasty were all foretold on a scroll of paper hidden in the headdress of a visitor to Baha'u'llah, a seemingly helpless prisoner in the fortress of Akka. Emperor Napoleon III of France, nephew of the more famous Napoleon I, was the most powerful and brilliant Western monarch of his day. His dream was to walk in the footsteps of his imperial uncle and complete his interrupted campaign of conquest. Upon receiving the first of two letters from Baha'u'llah, he reportedly cast it aside saying, If this man is God, I am two gods. Baha'u'llah's second letter is the one published in the Surah i Haikal. After condemning the emperor's insincerity and lust for war, Baha'u'llah wrote, For what thou hast done, thy kingdom shall be thrown into confusion and thine empire shall pass from thine hands as a punishment for that which thou hast wrought. Then wilt thou know how thou hast plainly erred. Commotions shall seize all the people in that land unless you arise to help this cause and follow him who is the Spirit of God, Jesus, in this the straight path. Hath thy pomp made thee proud? By my life it shall not endure. Nay, it shall soon pass away, unless thou holdest fast by this firm cord. We see abasement hastening after thee, while thou art of the heedless. Abdu'l-Baha recalls the text of this warning reached the whole of Persia, and as this Surah-i Haikal was circulated in Persia and India and was in the hands of all believers, they were waiting to see what would come to pass. Napoleon, then at the height of his power, went to war in 1870 with Germany believing he could easily take Berlin. Although, as Abdu'l-Bahá notes, no one at that time expected the victory of Germany. The French army was defeated that year at Saarbrück, Weisenburg, and Metz, then finally in a crushing catastrophe at Sedan. The breakup 
and surrender of Napoleon's forces constituted the greatest capitulation hitherto recorded in modern history. Napoleon himself was carried prisoner to Germany and perished miserably in England two years later.